please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hello and welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan and we have the privilege of uh, having on the show today the CEO and Chairman of Alstom, the global CEO and Chairman of Alstom, Andre Lafarge. Thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. Uh, let me start by asking you about the big railway plan now, and you had better luck on this front in comparison to GE, which has run into trouble uh, on account of the railway's plans to go electric. Uh, you've just visited your Madhepura facility in Bihar. Uh, give me an update of where things stand. I think it's a fantastic opportunity to uh, participate uh, to this uh, railway electrification. And uh, yes, as you said, I was uh, in Madhepura two, two days ago, uh, looking at our first locomotives, electrical locomotives, mm -hmm. which has been produced uh, in Madhepura, the first out of 800. And it's a fantastic uh, uh, challenge. And I think it's a fantastic uh, uh, adventure, uh, excitement. Uh, to participate to this uh, electrification of the network uh, in, in India. Mm -hmm. Are you on track now? Are you, you know, as far as uh, the completion of the order is concerned for 2019, what can we expect in terms of being able to deliver? Yeah, it has been a fantastic achievement. I mean, we've signed the contract two years ago. Yes. And in two years, we have developed a new locomotives, combining engineering coming from India and engineering coming uh, from uh, Europe. We have erected a new factory in Medepura and we have produced the first locomotive and we are testing this first locomotive right on time, exactly at the date uh, which was uh, uh, forecasted mm -hmm. at the signature of the contract two years after. So it's a fantastic uh, uh, achievement. For 2019 now, the next challenge is to enter into serial production and to increase the speed of the production of the locomotives. But the first challenge, which was actually to develop this locomotive, mm -hmm. has been totally met on time. So uh, where do conversations stand with the Indian government? Uh, because the railway ministry has a big electrification plan now. Uh, what is the opportunity that you see on account of that? And has there been any conversation with them about this? Yes, of course, we're talking a lot about the locomotives, electrical locomotives, which are participating to this electrification. But of course, we are also in the infrastructure. We are already participating to the dedicated freight corridors for electrification and signaling. And we are talking with the government on how to accelerate the deployment of electrification on the network. Mm -hmm. uh, how strategic is India for you uh, globally? Because if I were to look at uh, what you've been able to do in terms of sales, about 7.3 billion euros, orders of about 10 billion euros for you globally, uh, how strategic is a market like India for you in that? India is, is, is the future of Alstom. It's extremely strategic, both from a market standpoint because India is not only a freight market, a passenger market, it's an urban market, a mainline market. I mean, it has an extremely large uh, railway network. So as a market itself, it's extremely important, but it's also and equally important as a global platform. Mm. And we are exporting all what we mm. do in India is for the Indian market and for the export, 50-50. And we're exporting a lot from India to places like Australia, Middle East, Europe, uh, so it's both, I would say, a fantastic market mm. and a fantastic platform uh, in terms of technology, in terms of product development, in terms of supply chain. So it's key. And over the last few years, uh, we have come from a few hundred of people to more than 3,600. Mm. More than 20% of all our engineers worldwide are actually located in India. It gives the importance of India for us. Mm -hmm. So you're making in India for India and also you're making in India for the world. And you talked about using India as an export hub. Uh, give me a sense of where things currently stand on that front and what is the aspiration uh, of using India as an export hub? Absolutely. So we are using, uh, we are fully in line with the Make in India uh, policy for Indian uh, uh, market and also using data for export. I would say in terms of manufacturing capabilities, it would be more or less 50-50 from the Indian market and the exports. Mm. In terms of components or in terms of engineering, we are probably looking at 80% export and 20% uh, for the Indian markets. Okay. So the engineering forces are, are extremely important uh, in India. Are you going to be hiring more? You said that you've already uh, uh, increased your headcount to over 3,600 people. Are you going to be hiring more given the opportunities that you see here in India? And are you going to be investing more in India as well? 
Uh, absolutely. I mean, we are hiring uh, 20, 25 percent more employees per year, and we are continuing on that pace year after year. And there are plenty of opportunities, of course, uh, to serve the, the global market. We are happy and lucky to be in a world growth market. Mm. Mobility is a challenge in India, as you know. Mobility is a challenge everywhere in the world. Mobility in terms of quantity of mobility, mm. mobility in terms of environmentally friendliness of the solutions. So we have a huge growing market. So we are uh, investing 20, 25% more employees each year in India. And of course, we have also some physical investment that we are continuing to do to increase our capacity. Mm -hmm. Just take uh, an example, we are talking about Madhepura, right. but we have a, a metro factory in three cities near mm -hmm. Chennai. Mm -hmm. Last year, we have, doubled, we have doubled the capacity of this, uh, of this factory. Okay, you've doubled capacity at three city. So what would that mean in terms of uh, uh, the incremental investments that you hope to make? And you've also inked uh, new contracts worth, what, about 75 uh, uh, million euros here in India with the Chennai Metro, with the Jaipur Metro, etc. If you can give us an update on the contracts that you've signed and what that would mean in terms of incremental investments on your part. So e each year uh, we are investing I would say between 50, 50 million uh, euro of investment in terms of physical investment. Mm. But in our uh, type of industry, it's not only physical investment which is important, it's also all the expertise and the competence that we are bringing. I think our contracts that we have signed are illustrating the, the wide range of competence and expertise that we have in India. So it's not only, it's, it can be components, uh, it can be, uh, uh, like for Chennai, a complete metro, it can be infrastructure systems, signaling system. So we are really uh, investing in the full mobility chain. You know, you've been visiting India since the early 2000s. What do you think are the big differences that you see in India today, both from a market opportunity point of view, as well as a place to do business? Absolutely. I mean, I'm always extremely uh, delighted and excited to, to come to India for all these years. And what we have seen is a uh, increasing speed uh, of the market. Everything what is being done uh, in India is now uh, done much faster than in the past. And I think uh, mm. uh, our uh, achievement on locomotive is really illustrating that. Like uh, in two years that we are able to build a factory in BR states, means that there are infrastructure to do it, means that there are contractors, large companies to do it, and that the partnership with Indian Railway is excellent in order to achieve this kind of uh, uh, target and challenges. So the first thing is speed. I think speed has increased a lot. And of course, the size of the market and the size of the opportunities and the, la the, the size of all what we do in India has mm. been multiplied by 10 in all these years. There have been several developments for Alstom globally. The power business has been taken over by GE. Your focus now is largely on mobility. Uh, I want to ask you about the other global developments that could impact business and this has to do with President Trump's order imposing higher tariffs on aluminum as well as steel. Uh, you know, what do you make of that and the fear is that there could be retaliatory action from the EU as well as China. How does that impact a business like yours? Uh, first of all, uh, Alstom has refocused its operation on transportation. And I think, I mean, being focused today on mobility is the right thing to be. Definitely, the mobility challenge is the uh, challenge for the world, the challenge for all the cities in the world. So on that sense, I think the, the refocus of Astom has been a, a very strong okay. success. And now we are embarking to a new growth uh, strategy, a new growth uh, challenge uh, uh, together with, uh, with Siemens. As far as uh, the U.S. are concerned, I mean, we, have, uh, we are very much local in the U.S. Mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so we, we are a strong presence and we are manufacturing metros, high-speed trains uh, in the U.S. So in that sense, uh, the uh, Buy American Act is already uh, being applied to, to us in the U.S. Mm. Since we're talking about uh, the global environment, let me also ask you to comment on, on the new developments that we're seeing in, uh, in the mobility space, in the larger mobility space. And there's a lot of interest now on what something like a hyperloop could do, for instance. What do you make of that? I think it illustrates uh, the fact that the challenge, the mobility challenge is, is great and that nobody has really found uh, the solution uh, to meet this challenge. Uh, we believe, strongly believe, uh, that metro systems will uh, remain and are and will remain the core of the network of any system because mm -hmm. this is by far the most efficient system in terms of capacity. 
now there's a question for the niche mm. uh, what would be autonomous cars yeah. uh, we are bringing ourselves electrical buses which will be uh, an interesting part of this uh, of the challenge other people are thinking about other type of solutions mm. at the end of the day uh, it would be a multimodal approach mm. so in terms of vehicles we will have different types of vehicle the backbone will be railway because again it's the most efficient and the most environmentally friendly solutions mm. but it gives some room for other type of solutions as well you know since you talked about betting big on the metro uh, uh, solutions uh, specifically from an india perspective now uh, what more can we expect on that front which are the other state governments that you're in active conversations with uh, first of all uh, we are welcoming the fact that there is now a global metro policy uh, in india which sets uh, the vision which gives a, a long-term visibility uh, to, to our activities in India. Uh, there are a very large number of cities, I and mean, there are more than 40 cities which have projects of uh, metro. Uh, we are present, interestingly, in all the metro systems which have been developed in India, in one form or another, mm. either as rolling stock or signaling or infrastructure. So we are present in all uh, metro systems. Uh, you know, the government has uh, bet big on electric mobility as well, uh, though there is confusion on whether we will now see an electric vehicle policy or not, but electric buses and especially electrifying the public transport system uh, should be a priority. You just talked about electric buses. Uh, what's the plan here as far as India is concerned? Definitely mobility. The success of mobility uh, will be the success of electrical mobility. So we are bringing electrical buses and uh, we want to uh, introduce this technology. It's a fantastic platform, uh, which is uh, actually halfway between a bus and a, a tram. Uh, it has a very uh, interesting flat floor, very nice uh, passenger experience, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, dedicated to, I would say, uh, innovative solutions. So it's a cross between a tram and a bus? Absolutely. Okay. It's a hybrid solution, which uh, all, all the p when you are in it, you feel as if you were in a tram. Okay. So it's a wide uh, windows, wide doors, extremely comfortable. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want to bring. We are also uh, b want Have to you tied that up with any, any particular government at this point, any state we government? Are, we are discussing point? with partners as well okay. uh, to, to bring it uh, uh, globally. So it's still early days, mm. but extremely uh, positive and extremely uh, exciting. We are also uh, bringing electrical solutions. As you probably know, we have developed uh, an hydrogen train uh, in Europe. And that also can be uh, uh, of uh, great use to uh, meet the challenge of electrification. Okay. Uh, you know, outside of the mobility area, whether it's electric and, of course, uh, you just talked to us about some of the uh, future opportunities that you're looking at, uh, what else would you look at from an India standpoint today that looks exciting for you? Well, of course, mobility is our core, core business. So we look at all uh, the mobility sector. And what I say that in addition to railway, railway is our core business. We are looking at on other forms of mobility, and particularly in the digital mobility. So there is a huge dimension for mobility to mm. smart mobility, mm. and from smart mobility to smart city. We were discussing uh, yesterday at the uh, French Indian CEO Forum about smart cities, mm. and, and it's clear uh, that smart cities is a challenge, and I think progressively the digitalization of the mobility will become the digitalization of the city. And we want to invest, and this is one of the reasons why we want to team up with Siemens, mm. is to invest more and more in digital technologies in order to be the te technological provider for all public authorities in the cities. Mm. So in, in the global pecking order, where would India stand today uh, in terms of both revenue contribution uh, to Alstom as well as market opportunity? Uh, in terms of market, uh, market opportunity, India comes first, definitely. Uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, I would say uh, turnover, it's growing 20-25% per year minimum. It has one of the largest backlog in the world. So it progressively becomes as well in terms of activity the number one of, uh, for Alstom. So this is, this is your most important market then? Definitely. Well, Henri Lafarge, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18 and we wish you the very best of luck with your plans here at India. Thank you very much. Well, a very warm welcome. Um, as even as you're watching this broadcast, one can understand that you are connected at any given time to three, four, maybe even more number of devices. Uh, and well, uh, that begs the question, what makes these devices tick? Well, the answer is chips and processors. Uh, and while Intel has been uh, the proverbial Goliath, 
the question that one is increasingly answering is that has this Goliath perhaps uh, found its David on the back of some phenomenal performance in the year 2017 uh, by the company AMD. Um, this afternoon, in fact, I'm joined by uh, Lisa Su. She's heading the company. She's the one responsible for the turnaround. Uh, Lisa, welcome to the show. It's lovely speaking to you. Oh, thank uh, you so I much. I remember uh, the last time you spoke to CNBC TV 18, that was about three years back when you were just six weeks uh, into the job. How's this journey been? It's been a, a great couple of years. Thank you very much. It's great to be here in Delhi again. And I would say that uh, you know it's a great time for technologies. It's a great time for the processor business. So uh, we're very proud of what we've done at AMD. And most importantly, we're very proud of the products uh, that we're putting into the market to really drive high performance computing to as many people as possible. Well, what's interesting is that uh, while you say that, uh, 2017 has been a phenomenal year for you. Just the numbers, the way they stack up, uh, growth of over 20%, uh, strong guidance for the next quarter. Uh, this is perhaps in many ways the best year since 2004. Uh, what factors would you attribute uh, in terms of this turnaround that we're beginning to see with AMD perhaps being the proverbial David to the Goliath? Well, the most important thing for us has been our focus on technology and you know, bringing out great products. So over the last 12 months, we've actually introduced 10 new product families across all of our markets. And uh, that's really driven uh, some of the revenue growth. You mentioned um, over 20%. We grew 25% uh, last year, it's a billion dollars. And uh, most importantly, we've gained you know, market share with our key constituents. So you know, that's very, very important to us. So while you making this push, uh, before I come to which are the focus areas, uh, a question first on, uh, there, has been, there have been some tailwinds in your favor. Uh, one can imagine that the uh, Intel uh, issue where there, where there were bugs discovered, which perhaps uh, raised the security issue, which in turn perhaps influenced market wins. Uh, how much of that was factored in as far as 2017 is concerned? How much of a bonus was that uh, looking at AMD? You know, our 2017 was really focused on our product momentum across each of our market segments. And yes, security has become very, very important um, mm -hmm. in the uh, processor business. And at AMD, you know, security is a top priority for us. And I think we look at it as an opportunity to differentiate when we think about, you know, for all of our data that we share on mm -hmm. the um, internet, you want to know that it's secure. And so that's mm -hmm. certainly our focus as well. Let's you focus now uh, to India. Uh, this has been a space where uh, Perhaps the right ingredients have been there, whether or not uh, India has delivered, well, that's subject to debate. Uh, but let's talk about the one area. I remember this conversation that you had with Shireen three years back, and she asked you about smartphones as far as Indian market is concerned. And your answer then was that you're more keenly watching uh, issues such as interoperability, internet, uh, internet of things. And that's something that the current government is, ex is pushing extremely hard on. A uh, lot of investments are being made. Uh, we're talking about connectivity by way of BharatNet. About 100,000 uh, kilometers have been laid down. Uh, just your sense, the entire buzz that we're seeing currently here uh, as a part of the digital India drive, uh, how are you looking at in terms of infrastructure spends and the infrastructure readying itself for the next leap? You know, there's no question that um, the make in India and the digi digitization is very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the overall market growth, the market potential, um, the amount of uh, connectivity that still uh, needs to be um, included in the infrastructure and the number of devices mm -hmm. uh, that, are, uh, you know, that are connected but can still be connected, I think all are very, very good um, you know, opportunities. You know, from my standpoint, um, again, it's a journey, mm -hmm. and you know, we're on this journey together uh, with India. I think our uh, focus is on providing the underlying technology, you know, for this digitization, and um, you know, we view India as a very important market, but also a place where we do a lot of our uh, development. Just one question here that we are speaking of digital India. The government is uh, extremely gung ho about this. Uh, but again, I would borrow from the conversation with Shireen that you had the last time. Uh, when you first came here about three years back, uh, the questions that were being raised is perhaps, what is the advice that you would give as an engineer to the government in terms of digital India? Having seen what we have in the last three years, uh, just your assessment again as an engineer of how things have been and perhaps a word of advice as to things that the government can do to augment this outreach even further. Well, you know, I, I would say that I think the, the government has had a lot of focus on this. And so, uh, you know, our advice is, like anyone else's, is, um, you know, really focusing on the infrastructure and getting the infrastructure as capable as possible will we'll broaden the reach. And again, a lot of progress has been made, but no question, more progress could be made. 
Fair enough. Uh, let's your focus now to how we look at India, how AMD looks at India as a market. Um, very recently, they were from the Riser family, uh, we had uh, a few microprocessors which had integrated graphics. What that effectively did is that it brought the cost down and uh, catered perfectly, fit very well with the Indian matrix, with the Indian growth matrix. Uh, is that going to be a strategy going forward uh, for not just India but other emerging markets that you would look at uh, perhaps integrated graphics, perhaps bringing the cost down uh, so that the customer perhaps uh, uh, volumes games essentially? You know, our strategy in uh, processors with our Ryzen family is uh, to really provide uh, you know, processors at every single price point from the entry level with um, integrated graphics to the very, very highest end CPUs. And um, this strategy is paying off. You know, we grew market share, you know, last year here in India. Um, our uh, commercial market share is, you know, up close to 30%. Mm -hmm. And we believe there's more opportunity to grow there. And it's, it's really about offering, you know, the right performance at the right price to really broaden the reach of, uh, of this technology. Okay, uh, but is the volumes game something that perhaps you can look at? This has been one clear strategy behind the latest launches. Is that something that perhaps you can pursue more actively? Oh, a a a absolutely. I think volume is absolutely key. And, you know, again, as I said, we want our technology mm -hmm. in as many hands as possible. Fair enough. Uh, let's talk about Make in India. The, outside of Digital India, one key campaign that the government has been pushing forth has been Make in India. Let me first bluntly ask. Uh, Make in India, is that something that perhaps you're looking at? Making in India, perhaps bringing uh, the manufacturing here, is that something that's perhaps on the cards or perhaps you're looking at opportunities here? Yeah, certainly I think the government has had a very strong push in Make in India. You know, from AMD's perspective, um, we're not building manufacturing plants ourselves. And so, you know, we are um, primarily outsourced in manufacturing. But what we have been doing is uh, participating with um, you know, some uh, partnerships where, you know, people are looking at, you know, bringing technology into India. And we're very open to being part of those collaborations. Um, as a part of those collaborations, we understand that there are two R&D centers. There's, uh, there's one in Hyderabad, there's one in Bangalore. Just a sense as to how things have been doing there. And if perhaps you're also looking at having another R&D center here in India, is that something that's on the cards? You know, we look at um, India as such a critical piece of our R&D operation. We actually have over 1,500 people mm -hmm. across Bangalore and uh, Hyderabad, and um, some of our most important products really are end-to-end -end products on both hardware and software standpoint mm -hmm. are um, you know, made here in India. I think we always look at expansion possibilities. I think the talent in India is mm -hmm. um, very, very strong. And so, you know, overall, we're very, uh, you know, very bullish on um, the Indian market from a talent standpoint. All right, Disa, that's a bullish note to end the conversation on. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, and we wish you all the best as you reach out for Target 2020. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.